The Last of Us is arguably the best video game of 2013. It was developed by Naughty Dog Studios and was a PS3 exclusive. A remastered version was released for the PlayStation 4 earlier this year. Now you might be wondering why give this game a review so far after it's been released. Well, this game provides an insight into the nature of storytelling, something that we've never seen to this level before in a video game. And of course, this was their intention. We see video games as this incredible uh, medium to tell stories. We want to treat it as uh, equals to books or comics or TV or movies. This is subject matter that would not be considered out of the ordinary to tell in one of those other forms of entertainment. And I think that a lot of people would be interested in understanding why the critics are giving it such high praise. So for those that have already played the campaign and know the story, I probably don't even need to say much more. Most critics have wisely commented that this could set a new example of storytelling in video gaming. So for this review, we're not just going to gush about how good this game is. I've already gushed today and my magazine has gone missing. I mean, where did it go? Why are these all stuck together? Um. The goal is to explain what makes a good story and use The Last of Us as a case study of storytelling. Thus, while the game is good and worth revisiting on this new system, our job is actually to explain why it's good and not merely restate the obvious. So we're going to do this in two parts. In the first half, we'll discuss the mechanics and general world building elements involved in creating a narrative and why it's done so well here. It will be spoiler free and omit discussion of the characters and plot. In the second section, however, we'll be discussing the plot development and the logic of plotting. Anyone poking around the internet already knows that there's a lot of commentary to watch about this game. While some of it's interesting, my focus here is going to be understanding the nature of storytelling and drama creation. Thus, the issues of video game design are secondary. So this is a review of the game and its drama, not of game design. Number one. Reviving a genre. So before we get too deep into this, I think we need to review a bit about zombies. So in actuality, the word and idea of living people coming back as mindless automatons actually comes from Caribbean voodoo cults. Typically, it's an ancillary piece of mythology, but it's seen as a type of mind control. The idea initially had some interesting anthropological study with even a few books written on it, but it's taken a different turn recently. Now, the zombies that we know are actually the result of a single filmmaker, this guy, George Romero. He basically took the idea of the undead and used them to create a series of movies. As Americans, everything we know about zombies, including all that about eating flesh and brains, and infection through bites, comes from just a few films. So the first one was released in 1968 and was basically a story about some radiation from space that created some zombies. That's the space vehicle which orbited Venus and then pur was purposely destroyed by NASA when scientists discovered it was carrying a mysterious high-level radiation with it. The second was a more modern version of the same, only that happened in a mall. The third one didn't include anything of the initial infection, but merely an attempt at a workable solution. Say hello. Come on, Jeff. Give me a break, will you? Say hello to your Aunt Alicia. Say hello, Aunt Alicia. Overall, the films were merely set pieces in which to hang larger ideas, mostly basic issues of humanity. Things like irony. All right, Vince, hit him in the head, right between the eyes. The Destruction of Paradise. Trust in the human condition, and so on. Most of them had elements of tongue-in-cheek comedy mixed with dark and brutal gore. For the most part, they were decent films and spawned a ton of other media, including books, movies, graphic novels, video games, and even survival guides. Though all this new media was created early on, the notion of a zombie died out, for the most part, during the 1990s. There were a few successful video games and some books, but for the moment it did seem the dead had gone back to sleep. In the early 2000s, however, there was a revival of all things zombie, 
I'm not sure what exactly kicked it off, but I see a combination of a few things, with the first pair being the Resident Evil movie and 28 Days Later. So Resident Evil was released first in the spring of 2002, with 28 Days Later being released later. Not 28 Days Later though, it was more like 28 Weeks Later since it was like a year, but not like the sequel whose title was actually 28 Weeks Later. So this first wave I think spawned a second wave that really brought the dead back to life. In 2004, there were two more successful films, again one British and one American. The former was Shaun of the Dead, and the latter was a remake of Dawn of the Dead. What's interesting about these, besides the names, is that both were actually slated to release on the same weekend, but instead were changed at the last minute to avoid a conflict. So with all these having been pretty successful, an entire army of zombie-themed shit was soon released including things like The Walking Dead, The Zombie Survival Guide, Zombieland, The Left for Dead, Dead Island, The Abraham Lincoln Hunter Slayer, Vampire Weekend Slayer, Plants vs. Zombies, Resident Evil, Return of the Living Dead, Rob Zombie, 28 Weeks Later, Diary of the Dead, Daisy, World War Z, Warm Bodies, and so on. So with all this crap in the market, Naughty Dog Studios decided to throw their hat into the zombie's mouth and make their own. Rumor has it The Last of Us was in development for almost two years before anything was announced. Typically, this is a studio that only does one game at a time. In the past, this was the Uncharted series. Turns out they actually split their staff into a whole separate division to complete the game. So the Uncharted was their big previous hit, and the series is basically an Indiana Jones adventure game mixed with third-person action. So they basically took those elements and made a new world that happened to include zombies. Now the first thing you do when you go to make any video game or movie is to make a setting in which the story can exist. As most people now know, there aren't all that many new ideas, and everything that we know is basically recycled from somewhere else. This isn't a bad thing per se, but it should be realized going into any media. Since there aren't many new ideas or concepts, the goal is to merely combine simpler ideas more effectively. This brings us to our next point and the first dimension of storytelling. Number 2. World Building Any story needs a setting. It needs a world in which the events, the characters, and the action can happen. This needs to be a setting that makes sense to the audience, or can at least be accommodated with an explanation. This is done by finding things in the world that make sense to most people, normally by appealing to the lowest common denominator. For an example of how this is done, I think it's worth looking at the Avatar movie. While the movie itself is a terrible example of storytelling, it's a good example of world building because it grabs people on such a deep level. So deep, in fact, that people would go see it multiple times and even got depressed because it's not a real thing. So Avatar is basically a jungle world of giant blue people. To establish this world, they use some incredible visuals to portray a world of simpletons with a strong connection to nature. They use glowing flowers, glowing grass, and all kinds of glowing animals to make the world seem new. What is it with things that glow? Almost immediately, we see references to common animals and plants. Even the humanoids themselves are somewhat familiar if one takes a minute to break down the pieces. While most viewers probably don't realize that what they're seeing is merely a careful recreation of things they already know, it's done to such a level that it becomes engaging. This notion of engaging is really crucial to creating a good medium. Whether it's a movie or a video game, one of the first things to be done is to force the audience to forget themselves. In film theory, this is called the suspension of disbelief. It's basically the idea that we know that what we're seeing is fake, but that we can be convinced to forget that. If a movie is well done or otherwise plausible, we start to pay attention and thus act as if it were real. I bet you never thought that at the end the Navi would look and feel as realistic as the humans. You see, when a world is well built, it allows us to project ourselves and begin to care about the plot and the characters. If something is fake, however, or otherwise distracting, then we're constantly thinking about those distractions, and thus not on the story. So the first step in making The Last of Us is to create a world where stuff can happen. The more engaging and coherent it is, the easier that's accomplished. With zombies, however, there's a lot of common themes that most movies involve. 
Almost every one of them has a few of these elements, so these are things that should obviously be included. Since zombies are disgusting cannibals, it's got to include things like gore, dark and depressing themes, tons of violence, bodily mutilation, and so on. What else can you do with it, though? Well, since most movies have already covered the initial panic of the outbreak, early survival is out. Some often include an element of a cure, or at least an attempt to cope. Say hello to your Aunt Alicia. Say hello, Aunt Alicia. Most end with action-heavy endings and big explosions. There are even some intentional sacrifices that people make for each other and so on. What The Last of Us does, however, and this is truly noteworthy, is that they took the genre beyond that simple world. They used it to transcend its original simplicity, making it legitimate beyond its foundations as campy gore and humor. <laughs> As followers of zombies know, the genre has always been a bit self-aware, going lavishly overboard on occasions, whereas others have actually tried to remain grounded over the years. It's this notion of groundedness that The Last of Us really brings to the table. So since we've already seen the survival of small bands of people wandering the world and trying not to get eaten, they decided to cover a period where the world has reached an end state. The government has basically collapsed and people live in small quarantine zones within the skeletons of old cities. There are a few individuals that live outside the walls, but there really isn't much of a society left. The zombies themselves are even nearing the end states of their lives, or are evolving into a completely different thing. By taking the genre 20 years ahead, it creates a world in which they can use totally novel elements in their world building. For those of you that have played the game, I'm sure you noticed some of this stuff, but I think it's worth discussing. Number one, the decay of society. Basically, the first thing you notice in the new world is this pair of skyscrapers on the verge of collapse. One of them has become the leaning tower of pizza and looks about ready to fall. As we first venture into the world, we notice that grass is everywhere and that roads and buildings are in decay. We all probably saw these doors that were sealed years ago for safety purposes. This is a world that's being retaken by nature and reminds me a lot of life after people. It's actually pretty interesting how they construct this world since it involves these unique settings. More than the physical world, however, we're also told that commodity is scarce and that rationing and civil unrest is ever present. We also realize that there is a large black market filled with smuggling and gun trafficking and all the rest. There's even a later implication that smuggling is what keeps it all going. Why wouldn't they give them their food? Sometimes they ran out. Most times they just held on to it. That never happened in Boston. Trust me, it happened all the time. This is not a stable society, if one could even term it that to begin with. Number two, survival mentality. This is a staple of the genre, but it's done in a new way. While most things involving zombies require foraging for food or weapons, The Last of Us combines a decaying world with rationing resources. For those that have played in survivor mode, you'll remember that you're basically always running on less than 5 bullets and are getting by on the bare minimum. You'll never have enough weapons to kill everything and often have just enough to run past enemies. The crafting system is where the game really gets some elements of strategy. One can upgrade weapons, but with such limited resources, one has to ensure it's worth the investment. This is pretty cool since it can't be done in a movie setting, but it incorporates the player into the game. Number three, zombies everywhere. Like other video games on zombies, here we take an approach to classes as well. There are the standard mindless zombies who will easily swarm you, but they're only the most basic state. As one survives longer with the infection, the fungus actually creates newer and more powerful versions. Clickers are one of the more frightening enemies since they hear basically everything but are blind. It's a unique mechanic to give one ability while taking away another. The implementation was a little incorrect, unfortunately, since they were portrayed as if they were bats. They see using sound. Like bats? Like bats. If you hear one clicking, you gotta hide. That's how they spot you. In reality, they were actually more like Tyrannosaurus Rexes, since they could actually see movement, not just objects. Keep absolutely still. 
suspicions based on movement. Don't move! Can't see us if we don't move. If you live longer than a clicker, you actually become an even bigger monster called a bloater. These are things like tanks and have all kinds of armor and even a ranged attack. There's a charming simplicity to the classes, but still fulfilling when one defeats them. Number 4. Morality in a Post-Mortal World As is seen through the story, not all humans are in the spirit of cooperation, and in fact there are roving gangs that survive directly from other humans. This is a good background element because it helps to set the tone of what the military is doing, and it even helps to establish the motives of the Fireflies. It's a good world-building element as it helps to create a diversity of motives and a plethora of enemies. Often when a mindless horde is advancing, it's easy to get bored since there isn't much going on intellectually. The conflicts of these different groups ultimately form and give structure to the entire plot. The zombies themselves are only indirectly involved with the journey and the character development. Number 5. Characterization We'll really get into this when we talk of the plot, but the character development is almost perfect. Through the main plot and the expansion, the character motives, histories, and relationships with others are explored in detail. While not directly related to world building per se, creating these elements is needed for the suspension of disbelief. If you can't focus on the people you're supposed to care about, then you're less likely to care about what the overall plot is about. There's a ton that one could say about all of this, but I think this gives us the big picture. So while these elements are interesting by themselves, they're only as good as they work together. The Last of Us succeeds by creating realistic and detailed violence mixed with an incredible sound design. In preparation for this review, I actually captured a ton of footage without any sound on, only watching audio meters. Doing this was pretty destructive to the experience, and it actually took some time to recover the serious tone. It just seemed like pixels happening far away, none of which really mattered. In almost every respect, the visuals are only ancillary to their sound design. The key point to know here, however, is that it creates a truly visceral experience. For those of you that don't know the word visceral, I can sum it up with five seconds of footage from the game. <laughs> There's a ton of genius in the way that these shots are done, but there's two worth noting. The first is that the actual death animation is never shown. All we can see is what's going to happen. By never actually showing the death, we're not allowed to incorporate it into our psychology. This is an absolute work of genius since it causes us to ruminate. In the same way that less is more, not showing the death is key for causing one to avoid it thing in your head, it's that Hitchcockian thing about the danger that you see is less meaningful than the danger that's in your head. Our brain likes to finish sequences of events. It likes to understand things and tries to conceptualize the unknown. In many ways, we fear and loathe the unknown more than the known. What if the people are still inside? What if they're trapped in there without any control of their body? scared of that happening to me. Unfortunately, however, our brain doesn't like to picture the destruction of itself. Combining these two elements, however, wouldn't be nearly as effective if there wasn't some suggestion of gruesome death. This is where the sound design comes in. By allowing the sound to complete the scenario, we're forced to engage with the death, but never are allowed to truly experience it. This is an interesting case of liminality, since as a video game, you will respawn. This is also interesting because it only applies to death by melee. The other aspect of viscerality comes from the cutscenes. I bet you can take almost any scene and show it to someone, and they'd remember what was happening in the story. I bet even months or years after, one could watch a few chapters or scenes and remember the overall plot. I think a counterexample is really good here. Have you ever seen the second Transformers movie? Well, I haven't. I swear to God, I've seen it five fucking times, and I can't remember a thing about it. It's completely forgettable. I'm not involved with the characters, and I have no idea what's going on, and there's no reason that I should care. 
You see, when you compare this shit to The Last of Us, it's pretty easy to see why you're involved and care about the situations you're in and what's happening. By having a smaller number of characters and a plot with a definite focus, it's easier for us to concentrate on the situation at hand. The problem with the Transformers movies is that there's tons of irrelevant shit that's distracting you. You can't focus or concentrate on anything. You see, getting someone emotionally involved means sticking to situations that are similar to real life. If you can't process it and you can't understand it, then you really can't care about it. Now, the nature of world building is a means of establishing an environment where the actions and character choices become focused. Typically, this is done through the establishment of prominent rules, behaviors, and beliefs about things in the world. In most zombie movies, for instance, this can vary from the comical and casual nature of Zombieland to the ironic and depressing ending of Night of the Living Dead. There are always themes and worldviews that become established over the course of the story. That's too small for a grave. I forgot to leave that stupid robot on his grave. What should I do with it? I mean... What? I want to talk about it. No. Why not? How many times do we need to go over this? Things happen. And we move on. It's just... That's enough. <sighs> right. In film and video games, this is done very carefully, often in ways we can't verbalize completely. To give us an idea, though, let's look at the notion of set pieces. So The Last of Us is basically laid out as a snapshot of various locations that need to be traversed in order to progress. Each of these is incredibly detailed and often contain little comments from the characters, information about the world at the time, or just sort of detail in general. I was thinking the entire time through the campaign how the world has changed. There was a deliberate emphasis on demonstrating the reversal to nature, with the rotting destruction of the civilization that we're currently creating. I love the detail on how things that were once easy are now almost impossible to see in the same way. Shots of restaurants, college dorms, or even a cabin in the woods have now become hazardous places to live. Where once it would take 20 minutes to walk to a bridge down a street, it takes almost four hours of wandering through hotels, office buildings, and subway stations. Now all of this is of course relevant to this notion of world building. You see, it's about the establishment of a set of rules, a tone, a purpose, and a goal orientation. It's about creating a context where things are happening. Our brains know that the world is complex. We don't always care about it nor focus on it, but we know it's there. Thus, when something seems too simple, it also seems fake. We're fickle in that we don't care about it unless we don't have it. This again goes back to the notion of suspension of disbelief. The deeper the world seems to us, the easier it is to wade in. If it's too simple or anachronistic, then we're constantly asking ourselves basic questions. However, when the foreground is understandable, but the background has the appearance of depth, we're more likely to become engaged. Thus, as we learn the foreground, we can slowly incorporate the background as well. It adds additional layers and makes the world more interesting to experience. And the world of The Last of Us is pretty interesting. This detail is interesting in its own right, but I think it's important in another sense. In most respects, this is a game of half measures. As we'll get into in the story section, this is a game of mixed identity. Obviously, there is no clear good nor clear evil. Even in the world and zombie creation, this measure is present. For instance, the zombies are portrayed as creepy and beautiful at the same time. In fungus, they have these beautiful, saturated colors, and we really like that conscious of this something so horrific that it's gonna like stop at nothing, it's relentless force of death, and yet it, elements of it are beautiful. It's not just about gore. It's not just about everything about it being scary because to us it's actually scarier when things on it are some, somewhat benign or somewhat beautiful. Even the world is really off-putting from a technological perspective, but you can really see that nature is reclaiming its domain. We mentioned this before about the sound design, but here, this echoes again about the danger inside of your own head. It's a good balance between showing enough to give an idea, but not enough to go overboard. It's important for us that we don't underplay the violence, because then the threat doesn't seem as real. At the same time, we didn't want to make it so over the top, stylizing it, 
so then it doesn't become as real. It was important for us actually to hit that middle ground where it's kind of disturbing. And you can really see this with their frequent use of cutting to black after a scene. A final comment on world building is the concept of anchoring. This is a psychological term that refers to the tendency to anchor to a few things in the world while ignoring many others. While anchoring can be good in certain circumstances, it can also become problematic if used too tightly. On this point, The Last of Us truly excels. It not only takes the genre to a new level, but it also doesn't get caught up in the new world that it's created. It keeps the plot organized into a few small elements, basically focusing on a character story between two people. Number three, mechanics. So with all that crap discussed, we can finally get into the mechanics of this game. As you can probably guess, this one is similar to Naughty Dog's previous series, The Uncharted. Since our focus is mostly on the nature of storytelling, we're only going to discuss the mechanics in passing. So, while the mechanics are good, they are not the most important element of storytelling. This game does, however, use some interesting tricks to enhance it through gameplay, but some of the best moments still happen in cutscene. This game is basically a survivalist third-person shooter with an emphasis on inventory management and stealth. The goal is to travel places. Killing enemies and collecting items are not the direct goal and actually serve little purpose unto themselves. Often they block key exits or are otherwise dangerous, but in reality they're a distracting force, one which can sometimes be avoided to conserve resources. Most of the gameplay is using these limited resources to traverse the detailed world and then trying to find new resources while expending as little as possible. If the enemy is weak enough, you can choke them out or try to stab them. After a certain point, however, it's impossible to kill everything and sometimes enemies must be left alone. So we've discussed already a number of mechanics, including the use of sound design and all the rest. I think there are three worth mentioning. Number one, lights, camera, action. So this is a darkly lit game, a well-done camera with plenty of action. Broadly speaking, this is known as a third-person shooter, and it means that it has a detached camera and typically features shots of looking around corners, stealth, precision, and timed combat. It's a smoother and less random game than a first-person shooter, and is typically more strategic. Most of the games have more adult ratings and typically deal with much more mature issues beyond mere sexuality and violence. They tend to have better stories, especially when compared to other big-name games. The camera in this game is particularly well done. In certain genres, if one is in an open field or with a lot of space, then the camera angle doesn't matter a whole bunch. However, if you get into tight situations, with cramped caves, low-hanging debris, and other stuff, then camera management really starts to matter. This game, we really see how far Naughty Dog has come in terms of his work. Take this introductory shot from Uncharted 2. It's a good example of their skill and attention to detail in camera management. In The Last of Us, we see this similarly done in order to add detail and force perspective. This allows them to enhance a particular worldview and thus impress the world onto the player. I think this is important for a number of reasons. In the world we live in, and thus the world we experience, there are a number of things we cannot change. If we're short, we look up to others. If we're tall, we see over them. These are all things that just are. Video games are nice in that we can become other people and see things differently. It allows us a degree of freedom not normally allowed in the real world. Unfortunately, however, this freedom shouldn't always be limitless. Thus, controlling these camera angles helps to force a certain perspective if you're trying to create a specific world. By limiting control, we are more effectively merged with the world that they want us to see. It also helps in that it probably eliminates the technical distractions of invisible floors and walls that I'm sure we've all seen in other games. Number 2. Walking and Doing Shit As simple as the notion of walking and traversing the universe is, it's often a bit difficult. Thus, our second mechanic is the player management on corners and cliffs. In other third-person shooters, there were always those stairs or objects that you would get caught on, and end up wasting time turning and looking like an idiot. This really wasn't a problem here. There were a few issues with the ladders, but for the most part, you weren't constantly distracted trying to fix design flaws. Don't get me wrong, I thought Red Dead was by far the best game on the Xbox 360, but seriously, those fucking corners were annoying as all hell. The other thing that I really enjoyed was the specific interactions with Ellie. 
If you both get close, Joel begins to protect her almost like you would in real life. It's that attention to detail that really helps when you're exploring the world. If you were anything like me, then you probably spent most of the game in crouch mode, and thus enjoyed the variety of horses and environments. Surely some of the mechanics could use some work, but I'm glad that I could walk through shit, even if the AI couldn't. Number 3. Combat So this is probably obvious, but there are a number of mechanics about the combat that are innovative. Beyond the stealth mechanics and the inherent brutality, one of the things that stands out is what I'll term the filmization of combat. So for those of you that know the technical definition of film, you'll remember that film is basically a specific frame rate and emotion blending process that's done to a sequence of images. When we watch a movie, for instance, it's projected at a fairly low frame rate. Our brain, however, fills in the details and we interpret the information differently than we would have otherwise. When something hasn't been filmized, it often looks fake and doesn't have that same movie feel that we're used to seeing. Decades ago, people basically figured out that the human brain still fills in the details and absorbs the information, albeit a little differently. So this game uses the same underlying sleight of hand in its creation of combat. What they did on a technical level is to use frame skips to transition in and out of combat situations. I think this guy explains it best. Every hit reaction that an NPC plays, um, they are not necessarily in the correct pose. When you strike them the next time, we just pop them with a zero frame animation change, which is usually kind of a no-no, you know what I mean? Normally you want characters to blend smoothly and realistically into animations. But what we found is that um, you can cover that pop up with a heavy impact. They can go from almost any pose into the pose that the impact starts from and your eye just covers up the transition for you. This is basically an innovative step because it combines what we've seen before in film, but yet it feels new. On a deeper level, it makes the hits feel much more impactful because it's followed with weightiness. It doesn't feel like a brawler per se, despite the fact that it is basically punching it's given a compressed look, the brain is pleasantly tricked into projecting itself into the scene, almost exactly what filmization does for movies. In summation, this is a world without distractions. It's easy to just play. You often forget that you're playing a video game because you're not dealing with mundane problems of a video game. It helps to focus on the real problems at hand, like surviving and trying to protect this girl.